Hello, I'm Karen Ross. I'm Professor of Gender and Media at Newcastle University. My role in the project is to produce a series of short films uh, based on the field work. And together with my colleague Priyanshi, who will be doing the first cut of the films, this, this first film is uh, my reflection on the fieldwork visit I've just completed um, in Delhi in April 2023. It's been a few days since I returned from my recent visit to Delhi, where I was interviewing women entrepreneurs about their micro businesses, including the challenges they face, how they coped with during COVID, mm -hmm. and more generally, how they survive in environments in which many of us, including myself, can scarcely comprehend even as we witness it. I'm in awe of their resilience, their humour, their support for their families, and the efforts they go to to ensure that their children have the opportunities for a better life, which they have never had. I don't speak Hindi and was therefore entirely reliant on my brilliant interpreter Priyanshi, who also happens to be one of my graduated MA students from Newcastle, who returned to her family home in Delhi after completing her studies. We carried out 12 individual interviews with women across three sites, a slum area, Indra Kalyang Vihar, a resettlement colony, Trilok Puri, and an unauthorized colony, Ajit Vihar, each of which had different characteristics in terms of the built environment and access to basic facilities such as indoor toilets and clean water. While some of the women's businesses we encountered were similar across all three locations and could be largely seen as gendered, such as beauty treatments and handicrafts, others were more unusual, such as keeping livestock and recycling. What was also surprising were those particularly enterprising women who were not only subcontracting work out to others in their community, but had negotiated contracts with external organisations. For example, one of our interviewees made crocheted bags, belts and clothing, and her products were being sold online by a third party, although it wasn't entirely clear how much of the sale price actually found its way back to her. But when we talked to her, she pulled out her phone to show us the website where her work was being sold and encouraged us to buy something online rather than buy something from her there and then, as she made more money through the online sale. This canny approach to business is doubtless tied to a growing global interest in ethical consumption, but also demonstrates the value of working with communities at grassroots level in order to encourage self-determination and independence, rather than just throwing money at a problem and hoping that it will solve itself. However, one very big problem is health security. And everywhere we went, but especially in the slum area, we saw not just piles, but vast swathes of rubbish mushrooming across roadsides and wastelands. We saw open pipes full of water, which were centimetres away from the entrance to people's homes. We saw livestock rooting around rubbish tips looking for food. When we asked women about their health concerns, they mostly talked about physical ailments such as kidney stones or headaches, and occasionally mentioned water quality, but did not necessarily see illness as associated with their environment. And as they pointed out, when they had money, they bought bottled water, but when they did not, they used whatever water was available. What other option did they have? The other major problem which blights the lives of women and girls on a more or less continual basis is their personal safety. While individual women we talked to were mostly reluctant to talk about this issue, when we organised a safety workshop at Indra Kalyan Vihar, participants very obviously drew strength from each other's presence and were soon talking in very animated terms about the issue. When the workshop facilitator, our project partner Shveta, 
asked them where they felt unsafe in their environment, they chorused everywhere. In the workshop, women were asked to put post-its on a map of their settlement to indicate the danger hotspots. And pretty soon, the map was covered in pink squares. One of the other fieldwork facilitators, Kamla, drew a map in flower and asked women to sprinkle turmeric on the places where they felt unsafe. And again, the map quickly bloomed with an abundance of yellow flowers. One of the women said that men would regularly remove the light bulbs from the street lights next to the women's toilets. And another said, in answer to a question about whether young women were more vulnerable to attack than older women, that no, no woman was safe. Men were indiscriminate in their choice of victim. Yet another said that she feared stepping out of her home for any length of time because it meant that her daughters were vulnerable to attack alluding to, but not quite naming, the reality of abuse in the home. While all these comments were hard and horrifying to hear, I was reminded of a recent conversation I had with my own third year students in Newcastle, who walked me through the various safety protocols they agreed with each other before they set off for an evening out. While the mitigation strategies employed by women were very different, for example, the women in Delhi would go to the toilets in twos and threes. The fear that prompted them was depressingly similar. And this brings us back full circle to empowerment. Women can be as entrepreneurial as they like, can perfect their craft and selling skills, can spread the love around to other community members. But if they are forever looking over their shoulder, inside or outside, then their capacity for real independence is necessarily compromised. However, what was heartening to learn about were both institutional and third sector initiatives which have been set up to respond to women's safety. In Delhi, the regional government has devised the pink ticket scheme, which means that women can travel for free on all buses in the city. And there's a usually male marshal on every bus. On the metro, there is one carriage, usually the last one, which is exclusively for women travellers. Both these initiatives not only help to keep women safe, but also expand their options in relation to how far they can safely travel to work or for education. During my time in Delhi, Priyanshi and I decided to go slightly off piste and do some guerrilla filmmaking about and on public transport. With her signature chutzpah, Priyanshi approached women as they waited for their bus or their train. Almost all of them agreed to be interviewed and almost all of them said that they now felt safe when traveling. Interestingly, on the bus that we traveled on, the marshal kept looking at us as I filmed passengers, but did nothing. As we walked to the front of the bus to get off, Priyanshi cheekily asked him if he would answer a couple of questions, to which, surprisingly, he agreed. I tentatively pulled my phone out, expecting him to wave it away, but no, he was happy to be filmed. It was rather a surreal moment, but one we were happy to have pulled off. The downside of which was that by the time we actually did get off the bus, we had no idea where we are, where we were and had to flag down a taxi to take us back into town. But that was a small price to pay. Bef before the visit, I had been made aware of an initiative called My Safety Pin, which is an app which women can use to plot a safe route from A to B when they arrive in a strange place. What I didn't realise is the app is actually global and works as a bottom-up application where users can make their own contributions to the global database by answering questions about particular features of wherever they are. Through our colleague Shveta Matur, I reached out to one of the developers of the app, Ruitui Mandal, who very generously agreed to meet with us during the fieldwork visit and show us how the, work, uh, how the app worked in real time. 
much to the bemusement of the taxi drivers who were loitering outside our hotel in the most expensive part of Delhi waiting for a fare. Priyanshi and Whitwi made an assessment of the locale in terms of safety and, unsurprisingly, it scored pretty well. I'm going to use it the next time I find myself in big market on a Saturday night and imagine that the score will be a little less flattering. I was in Delhi for 10 days and during that time I learnt much and had some of my Global North assumptions challenged about everyday living in informal settlements. I was unprepared to see glass fronted stores with smart young men selling mobile phones and other tech up close and personal alongside public urinals, wandering cows and street food vendors. I was bemused at the sight of women in saris walking with daughters wearing pink tutus, of children wearing school uniform and the ubiquity of the mobile phone which seemed to be in every hand. I was surprised at the setup of the beauty parlour, kitted out with professional mirrors and hydraulic chairs and the ease with which the young owner multitasked answering our questions, rocking her child in its crib and arranging new client appointments on her phone. I was in awe of the young women we met who spoke en excellent English and were enrolled in local universities and colleges, studying for degrees with only their phones through which to access the curriculum off-site, all the while living with their families in one or two shared rooms. When I commented to Priyanshi, somewhat patronisingly as it turned out, that it was amazing that poorly educated mothers recognised the importance of education for their children. She looked at me pityingly, making the very obvious point that the mobile phone has given everyone the internet and thus a window onto other different and better worlds. Three things will stay with me for a while. One was hearing the burning ambition articulated by so many of the young women we met to achieve their goals, who recognised that it would be their own efforts which would make that a reality, not handouts or step-ups from others. Another was watching Priyanchi approach a man travelling in the women's carriage on the metro, as she pointed out the very large sign on the window which said this, and telling him that he should move to the next carriage. He gave her that look, that look which says, I don't need to pay any attention to anything you say. I'm sure that every woman in the carriage held their collective breath as this, it, this scene unfolded. Seconds passed, stalemate, but he had no friends around to bolster his bravado. After 15 seconds or so, he gave her one last long look, but he knew he was defeated. He walked through the carriage and entered the next one. I like to think that Priyanshi's courage has given confidence to some of the women who were in that carriage that day to follow his example the next time they see a man who is somewhere he shouldn't be. Lastly, I was overwhelmed by the generosity of the women who agreed to be interviewed or participated in the workshop or talked to us at the bus stop or on the metro platform. There was absolutely nothing in it for them no side hustle which would give them anything other than the opportunity to tell their truth. My hope for this project is that their testimonies will fall on the ears of people who will both listen and act. I cannot conclude without giving a huge shout out to all the people on the ground in Delhi who made this such a productive and inspiring visit to the community facilitators Kamla, Manju and Deepak and our project partner Shveta, all from the Jania Collective, and to Bala and Anshika from Indus Information Collective, and to Witty from Safety Pin. Lastly, I couldn't have done it at all without the support and friendship of Priyanshi. Her natural skill and flair as an interviewer and her interest in the world around her will stand her in very good stead when she eventually becomes the journalist she is destined to be. 
she already has very good investigative skills, as demonstrated by her finding the most interesting places for us to eat, and her willingness to risk the wrath of the apparatchiks, as when she smuggled in a takeaway to our hotel by way of her capacious tote bag. Thank you to, to you all. Shukriya.